Well, there's no problem. If you had a gun, shoot him in the head. Welcome to Shoot Me Straight. Dave Fields, Eddie Gallagher. We're here with our buddy Andy. And Andy has, I'm so excited about this one. He has an incredible story. He was a uh, fighter fighter uh, during 9-11 in New York City. Um, and we had lunch with him previously, but we made sure he didn't tell us any of it. So this is the first <laughs> time we're hearing it too. Super excited about it. Um can you give us just a little bit of background where you grew up? What brought you to New York City? Did you grow up in Long Island? Or Yeah, I grew up on Long Island um, and uh, didn't grow up in a firefighter family. No one in my family ever was. And then I met my first wife, and her dad was a retired firefighter. And um, when we got engaged, he said, hey, uh, you want to take the test? I'll pay for it, you know, you and his, me and his son. I said, sure, you know. You got that's what you got to do, future fall and all. You got to <laughs> round nose a little bit. So I had no idea, you know. And uh, so I took the written test and did real good on it. And I'm like, oh, pretty cool. I'll, I'll, I could get, in, I can use getting in shape. So the physical was going to be, you know, like nine months later. So I just said, I'm going to do the best I can, regardless of whether I become a fireman or not. I'm going to work out. And so uh, I did. I got 100 on the physical, crazy physical. Uh, a couple of people died taking the physical. It was such a... Really? Yeah. What uh, What does the physical consist of? It's it's all like stuff you do as a fireman, like, you know, dragging hose and lifting ladders and um, climbing upstairs and pulling up hose. And, but you had to do it in four minutes, under four minutes to get the 100. And yeah. because I was from Long Island, I didn't live within the city limits. I had to... I, hadn't, I needed the 100 because you got... Five points if you lived in a city, which they were trying to uh, encourage more minorities to, um, you know, to, to take the test. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I, we had it had gotten delayed, delayed because of the two guys that died. And then finally came my day and um, the guy in front of me, this big, really in shape black guy goes and, you know, we, you wait like 30 minutes before. So we're, we're talking and I'm like, all right. You ace this, now I'm going to look bad, you know. So <laughs> so he goes, and then I'm waiting. You can't see the finish line from the start line, and I'm like, I'm waiting. I'm like, what the heck is going on? And uh, all of a sudden I see him being wheeled out on a stretcher. I'm like, oh, <laughs> what's going to happen to me? <laughs> so uh, long story short is uh, I had, for nine months before, I had my father-in-law, my ex-father-in-law um, hooked me up with a guy that, specifically trained guys for these kind of physicals. So I had worn a 40-pound uh, weighted vest every waking moment for nine months. I got up to that line. Then they said, you're next. I dropped that thing, and I flew like a gazelle. You know, think about 40 pounds. Oh, yeah. Your body has now been, you know, I got used to that 40 pounds, and, and I finished it just in 3 minutes, 59 seconds. And actually, I finished in 3.55, and I fell at the end. And the guy came over, and he screamed. He goes, pull it. I was pulling the dummy across the line, and his ankles were still on the line. I went, ugh. And he goes, you made it. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God. But that was the difference of becoming a fireman or not. I mean, that, if I didn't pull that dummy, that's it. We're not having this conversation right now, you know. Wow. Do uh, most people uh, struggle to make that? Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, 33,000 people took the, the written test. Uh, like 22,000 took the physical and I think they ended up hiring about 3,000 off that list. Dang. Over the course of, I got, I was on the top of the list. I waited uh, a little over six years to get hired. So, I mean, it was, a, it was, a lot had to happen for the stars had to align for me to end up in the firehouse, you know. it was. Uh, How many firefighters are there total in New York? Um, well, we have New FDNY City. is about a little over 10,000, um, but that includes EMS. Uh, when I was on, it was... Uh, it was like 3,500 firefighters, I believe the number was. Uh, yeah. It's it's a long time for me, you know. And, you know, in spite of the lack of gray hair, I'm older than I look. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I mean, you, people ask me, "Hey, you know this guy?" I'm like, mm, there's 10,000 firemen yeah. in, in five boroughs, and yeah. you know, but and it's been 21 years since I've been in the firehouse, so. Um, yeah, it's, I don't always know everybody yet that people ask me. Throughout New York City, how many firehouses are there? There's about 270-something engines, and there's about 160-ish uh, truck companies, which some of them are doubles. And then there's, uh, you know, 
there's battalions and, you know, it's like my firehouse was an engine, a truck, and a battalion. So we had 13 people on duty in my firehouse each shift. So six on the truck, five on the engine, and then a chief and his driver. So that was a, that consisted of shift. So, uh, wow. but then we we were in a battalion that had had another truck and two more engines, and on uh, you know, and then we if you when you had an alarm assignment, you'd get rescue and squad and more chiefs and you know it's just uh, it's a it's a big it's a big convoluted thing, but they work it out pretty well. How much? How different is it being a firefighter in New York City versus like a firefighter like in like a small city? Well, I mean, I after I re- they retired me, I I was able to luckily get on with a department in California as a uh, uh, fire marshal type role, uh, which I you know I couldn't go in the fires anymore, but I was able to. I did some arson investigation. Anyway, the the city I worked in. We all, we had six stations, uh, three people on in each on each rig, wow. you know. So it was eighteen total. There was thirteen in my firehouse. Wow. You know, we went to in New York. My company at the time was doing about thirty six hundred runs a year, about six hundred fifty structure fires a year. The uh, California, the department I was on, they did six fires as a department the first year I was there. So wow. six, you know. We yeah. do, we've done that in a day. <laughs> yeah, it's it definitely is, like, depending on where you're located at. Because yes. I, I worked yeah. in a uh, fire department, you know, when I went through special operations medical school, the last month you have to work at a fire station in a emergency room week on, week off. Oh, okay. And so I worked in Tampa with the fire department there, and there was calls all the time. I mean, mo- mainly they were like, you go to the house, and it was – Somebody that was fat that couldn't get out of their chair, they yeah. would take them to the hospital and Medical whatever. Aid, yeah. But I mean, it was just constant busy. And then I, I went and worked at one for two weeks up in Virginia and out in the country. And I think one call, like mm-hmm. the rest of the time, you're just chilling. But you know, I try to stress to everybody, like even those guys I work with in California, that has that changes nothing about being a firefighter. You you go to work, you put the uniform on. Mm-hmm. Any at any given moment, you could be in the shit. Period. So, you know, don't you can't take anything away from guys that happen to be in a slower department. They're still yeah, will, willing to at any point do what I did more regularly because that's where I ended up. But um, I mean, all everyone we know, everyone who puts a uniform on, wartime, non-wartime, you know, uh, the city is unrest or whatever. You put a uniform on, you're putting yeah. your your life at risk, and you know, hopefully nobody ever has to do it. But we know it's. The potential's there, so you know I don't I don't consider a slow department in California any less than a busy department in New York City. Yeah, gotcha. What um what year was it when you first became? I got on I got on the job in July of ninety two. Ninety two. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah, July July first, nineteen ninety two. Um, I took the written test in October of eighty six. It took that long to get hired, and I was near the top of the list. So I was a different person from there to there. As a matter of fact, by that point, I had a kid. <laughs> so it was, uh, things really changed. And, and when you become a New York City fireman, you don't make any money for the first five years, literally. I mean, if, if I had a second kid, I would have been eligible for food stamps when wow. I became a fireman. Really? Yeah, which is a, was a sad state of affairs. I believe they've corrected that since 9-11 uh, opened some eyes to, you know, what yeah, we should be what getting What you guys paid. actually do. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, what, so. what you should be getting, yeah, paid for. Uh, so you That's were good. nine years, you were nine years on before nine eleven. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was uh, not enough. I loved it. I was in pretty busy firehouse. I was. In, I went right to a, a ladder company right out of probie school, and I spent my whole career there. My plan was to hopefully spend forty years there, but you know, it didn't turn out that way. But uh, uh. what is um, I mean. Taking nine eleven out of the equation, what is like one of the craziest calls that you went on? Well, I mean, every day was was something uh, unique. I was there the first bombing uh, of the towers when they hit it from below. But uh, you know, we went to a lot of fires. Uh, I, one one of the craziest ones is, is we went we're out doing building inspection and we came across an apartment that it turned out the lady had alligators living in the third floor <laughs> apartment in Brooklyn. 
in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. She had it was a full on. I mean, she had a rainforest go, go, going on in her apartment, and and she claimed that the the seven foot Cayman that was taken away slept in bed with her, and there was no threat to anybody. But I can't imagine <laughs> crawling into that apartment <laughs> in a smoky. You know, smoky middle of the night and coming across that thing. Most dangerous environment imaginable. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And <laughs> and we know that they, those animals are going to react the way they react. They're not going to be. They, it might be a friendly little caiman during the day, but he, yeah, he wasn't going to be happy if we showed up <laughs> at night in the smoke and the heat and you know. But I, we could spend hours. I mean, you know, we we woke, on one Monday morning we got a call like six thirty in the morning for a, a school full of smoke. And it took us like an hour to find the fire. And when we found it, we ended up uh, trapped on the wrong side of it, you know. And then the, the schools in, in uh, Brooklyn, their windows are all barred and, uh, you know. And it took them a long time to find us, to come and hit, hit, you know, get water to us, to get out. And, you know, it got dicey. You know, we, me and my, my, I was with my lieutenant at the time and, and, uh, we were like, we, we're going to have to make a run for this through this fire if they don't get here soon because it started getting hot. And, you know, things like that went on, but it was normal. It was, that's what we did. Yeah, it's you know? part of the job. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've been, I was very fortunate. Um, I got I'm, I got hurt a couple of times, but nothing major. And, um, you know, even 9-11, I guess in a way, you know, I'm here, so I'm blessed. You know, I, I lost 13 close friends, so... Um, it's hard to say. I, we could sit here for hours. I talk about jobs that I went to, but uh, you know, it, there's no feeling like turning the corner and the building's roaring, you know, and and you, your adrenaline kicks in and you just you go to work. Yeah, it's it's, it's an amazing job. It was I loved it. Yeah. Um, you know, I worked in a in for a, for a white kid from Long Island. To me, that was culture shock. Where I worked, I worked in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, and on a normal day. You know, you'd, I'd probably cross the street because we didn't get along. We're two different types of people. But you go to a fire and you, you save their cat or you put the fire out and save some of their stuff, and they want to hug you and thank you. And and it the feeling of, yes, we're all humans, you know, yeah. that comes up at that point is incredible. You know, it's just it's something you can't – you don't get out of your mind, you know, and you feel bad sometimes because we all do it. We have our stereotypes in our head whether we act to them or we don't. But they're there, and then something like that goes on, and you're like, "Oh, how do how did I even think like that?" You know, mm. but uh, it's a uh, it's a good feeling to to know that you can help people whether they really want your help or not, and then they appreciate it. You yeah, know? yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So leading leading up to nine eleven, like, what were the weeks like before that? Was it uh, just pretty normal? Yeah, everything was pretty normal. Well, not necessarily for me. Uh, I got divorced on August 26th. I was married. F- it was actually my 12th anniversary the day I moved my my ex-wife out, m- moved her out, set her up in her apartment. And we, ju- we got married young, oh. and uh, but I got divorced. And so now with two weeks later, my li- life already was upside down. Yeah. My kids moved out with, you know, with her, and um, and then 9-11 happened, and that, you know, I lost 13 friends that, that morning. And uh, plus the numbers that, that we, you know, the 343 that, you know, we knew, but we weren't necessarily yeah. friends with. We but were still, still firemen. So that, that frame for me was completely different than it was for other people. Uh, you know, what we, is the, um, before we get into the 9-11, like the divorce rate and being a firefighter? I think it's kind of high, and yeah. I believe it's because we love – going to work yes most most guys kiss their wives goodbye can't wait to get home and i'll see you later we go to work we love going to work and it's not that we don't love our wives and our families but we really love doing our job so it's bye honey i'll see you later you know we're excited to go to work and and then you get stuck you first of all we weren't making any money which meant we all had second jobs third jobs anything we could to feed the family so we were never home i believe that's why i i got divorced you yeah, know, because I was never home, and then when I was home, I was tired. <laughs> you know, it's yep. It's I can relate to that. I mean, it's interesting to me that uh, you know jobs like being a firefighter or law enforcement, or and when you're in the military, you know, obviously I I can only speak to the special operations career, but any job where you're 
you're completely 100% in. You can't wait to go do the job. Um, and then it also takes time away from the family constantly. It's, oh, yeah. Yeah, the divorce rates are always high. I believe in the SEAL teams, the divorce rate is 120%, and that's because it's counting second divorces. <laughs> yeah, I believe yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's you know, and then, you know, you become a family, so you start doing things with them. And so the whole the whole world becomes the fire department. Yep. And some, some women ha- are professionals have careers and and that gets lost because their husband's a fireman or their husband's a cop or their husband's in the military you know and people other people want to be friends with you and want to you know talk to you and want to know what it's like and and the women get lost in the shuffle you know and and we don't realize we're doing it but it happens yeah oh yeah it takes a strong woman to, yeah. to stick with yeah you know people in our profession for yeah, sure. see, I always thought because uh, her dad was a fireman that she would, it would be different for her, you know. But I not I shouldn't say because I didn't consider that until she told me we were getting divorced. But uh, you know, as when I thought about it as the years went by, I was like, well, yeah, I guess. I mean, I could see it. You know, she got kind of, she became my wife, not not Christine anymore. She was my wife, Andy's wife. Oh, Andy's wife. Oh, sh- her her husband's a fireman. Oh, you know. Yeah. It's all about you. Yeah. Yeah. Whether we want it or not, yep. it's how it becomes. You know, and then if like especially like see I because I got divorced two weeks before nine I didn't get to experience it probably got worse after nine eleven because we really became in the spotlight and and the why is really so I'm mean, I'm gonna say that probably afterwards, maybe not immediately, but in as in as the years have gone by, a lot of them really got lost. Yeah, and it's not only dealing with, you know, you guys and your job and and being in the spotlight and everything it's also the wives have to deal with all the trauma that comes well that's with the, the job other thing. and Every deal time with the husbands leave, yeah, yeah coming home mm-hmm. is he going to come home is, is he, he going to come home or what problems is he going to have what mm-hmm. did he see today right. that you know now the family has to deal with mm-hmm. yeah. yeah i mean it's my a tough my, tough gig my ex mentioned a couple of times how you know i saw you on the news th- today i said yeah it was pretty bad and yeah i saw you on a stretcher <laughs> i said well yeah i'd be calling her from the hospital that i'm okay and she's like yeah but i didn't need to see you on a stretcher today and i'm like well i can't help that yeah. but <laughs> don't turn on the tv <laughs> yeah but uh yeah it's it's you know it's definitely it's a hard balance to keep you know to be yeah to stay you know you our our hearts and uh, and what we want to do is we want to help people we kind of sometimes forget we need to go home and help help what's going on at home too, uh, but we can't turn it off. You know, it's yeah. Uh, even to even today, my current wife is was not around when I was a fireman, but we sit on the beach and and the first thing she tells me, is, if someone starts screaming and well, you are not going in that water, you know, she knows I'm getting up to go in the water. Yeah, so well, that's she, the way you're built. Yeah, she she went and bought these flotation devices. She said, "What well, if you go in that? Well, you better grab this." I said, well, I'm, if some woman is screaming her kid's drowning, I'm going in, yeah. you know, and I will grab that because I get it, you know, but it's hard. It's because we're wired a certain way. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah, y'all relate a lot on that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, something goes down, you're driving by a 7-Eleven, you're going to, you see something going on, you're going to crash Yeah, it's car built into us. Right, exactly. I mean, you're going to do what you got to do. That's what yeah. we, we were trained to do. Which is a good thing. I mean, it's a good characteristic to have. It just has consequences. Right. That's all. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and uh, sometimes we don't know them, but they're there. You yeah. Know, we just still going to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. I can't wait any longer. Yeah. Go ahead, brother. <laughs> Tell us, man. Leading up to, leading up to, you, you said two weeks earlier you got divorced, mm-hmm. and then like uh, any anything significant up to the morning of nine eleven. No, it was a regular day. I worked a twenty four hour shift, the, the shift before, mm-hmm. so and I drove. I drove a ladder truck, um, so I was fortunate. Eight of my, well, seven of my uh, nine years I drove, so and I love driving, but. Um, so the, the chauffeurs used to relieve each other a little early because, you know, this way you can fuel up you, if you want to wash the rig early, or whatever, you know. So I'm in the shower, and uh, the first plane hit, and they came upstairs and said, hey, a plane just hit the towers. Oh, sh- you know, so I dried off, went got downstairs the day shift, got the call to go into Manhattan, and, uh, you know, what was no, what was at the time an initial plane crash. So from the roof of our firehouse, we could see the towers. So we went up on the roof, and we're watching, and we're, I remember saying, man, that thing's going to burn for days. You could see how many 
floors were on fire. And, and as we're watching, we saw the second plane. I remember saying, is that a news hell? What is, wait, no, that's a plane. What the hell is another plane? And, and then it, we literally watched the second plane bank and hit the second tower. And we were like, oh, shit, this is not an accident. Mm. So we ran downstairs and uh, we're listening to the dispatch and we're listening to trying to watch on the TV, see what, what the heck's going on. And the phone rang. And guy in my firehouse, Danny, was the first one killed. Um, he got hit by a jumper um, as they were heading in. You know, and so he was with uh, engine 216 that was in my house. And uh, he, this, the, the guys relayed to us later that he had turned around to them and said, guys, we're, this is going to be, it's going to be the worst day of our lives. And when he turned around, he got hit. He died instantly. Um, our department chaplain was giving last rites to Danny when he got hit in the exact same spot. So to me, wherever that, wherever those people came from, it had to be bad. I mean, I can't imagine what, what prompts a human to jump out a hundred-story window, thinking it's a better option, a better way to go. You know, uh, all I can envision is you know you're in a room with colleagues that you work for, for te- work with for ten years and. And whatever they were going through, you didn't think that that you wanted that as well, and you jump out a window, you know. So when Danny was killed, um, he literally saved those guys' lives. The guy that went in with Danny left to the hospital with Danny. So they weren't there when the towers came down. So um, remember, um, we, had, we started organizing. We, had a, we got a spare engine in our battalion, and we started organizing people, and we uh, – got ready to head in, see what we can help with. And the, f- the first tower started coming down, and we were like, I remember thinking, oh, my God, the whole top of that building fell off. And turns out that wasn't the case. It was the whole building came down. So we headed, we headed over to Brooklyn Bridge. We're about, we're about two miles as the crow flies, but as the city streets, it takes a little bit longer. And uh, we heard on the radio, um, Mayday, Mayday, Tower 2's coming down. And, uh, and it's, uh, you know, that's... That's when we realized, oh, man, this is going to be bad. And we pulled up and couldn't recognize where we were, couldn't tell you to this day where the rig got stopped, jumped off, smoke. I mean, you know, you saw the plumes. It's, um, it was unrecognizable uh, and basically started heading in. And uh, when the smoke cleared, it was like, and it didn't, it didn't clear like that. It just kind of lifted. Um, we started realizing how many guys were missing. Still couldn't imagine what actually the numbers were at that point, but um, we basically we had to regroup. You know, uh, I've spoken a lot at um, you know conferences, and you know, it's pretty much what we're talking about here now. But you know, when you talk about like uh, leadership conferences and whatnot. Well, we were the epitome of how important leadership is and good leadership because all of our chiefs and, you know, heads of department were killed instantly. They were there in the command center at the base of the building. You know, you saw them on that, that French video. They were, they were at the bottom of the escalators. Well, mm-hmm. they were all gone. And basically, we dusted ourselves off, and because of our training, because of our discipline and and what we were taught to do and how we were, it was, you know, ingrained into us. you got to do your job no matter what. That's what we did. We kept moving with, n- with little to no direction, you know. And I know the numbers of people we saved were not what we would have been, you know. Um, we don't like to think about it because we, our job is to save people. We really didn't save a lot of people. We Maybe our actions prevented some deaths. I know the guys that got there that were up in the <coughs> 70s and 80s, letting, you know, helping people down, yes, they saved a lot of lives that way. Yeah. But like when I got there, I didn't save nobody's life. You know, that's part of my, part of my problem with, oh, you're a hero. No, not really. I mean, and they're like, no, you're a hero. And, but over, over, the, over time, when I stopped getting mad about that expression, that hero expression, I started to realize that they, they're looking at me just like the people are going to watch this and know nothing about me. And they say, oh, that guy's a hero, man. He's a 9-11 fireman. It's the uniform. 
it's what the yeah. guys that lost their lives did that gave me hero status. You know, it's like, but it's not like it's not like I stood a hundred blocks away to prevent myself from getting killed. I did exactly what everybody else did, and so okay. I mean, if you want to call it a hero, that's fine. But I don't. Yeah, we. I remember we talked about yeah. this at lunch, and it's you know it's the same premise. I think guys have. You know, from my old career, they have that survivor's guilt, and then they're also like, yeah, I'm not a hero, or I don't want to be called one, but because you, when you work amongst heroes, actual heroes, it's hard to hear somebody call you one, because you're like, no, I was just trying to keep up with these guys. Right. And But in the end, you are a hero. You are living for those individuals right. who did not make it, yeah, and you yeah. are representing them. Exactly, and that's the key, to represent well. You yeah. know, if we forget about those guys, that's when I need to be ashamed of myself. You know, it's it's because we did we everyone did what everything they could. Uh, you know, started digging at that point, looking for friends, looking for anybody, any survivors. And the sad part, the hardest transition was number one, we saved lives. We couldn't save any lives at that point. You know, once the towers were down, then okay, let's find these bodies and give families closure. We couldn't do that. Then let's find something for these families to have closure. We barely could do that. The, the, I dug for two months straight, and the, the, I, I found the upper torso of a, of a guy, and, and that was it. You know, we, I found this guy's head, and I started digging, and I found his shoulders, and, and we got down, and there was a big, like a 12-inch tall I-beam, and... Um, <coughs> At that point, you know, we got we had iron workers and whatnot, and and we we cut that beam into a piece that we could lift, and like twenty guys got on it, and I pulled them out from his shoulders, and the, w the rest of them wasn't there. Mm -hmm. I don't know where the rest of them was. You know, twenty floors up. You know, to where we don't know, but it's so hard to accept. You know, you you you're there to save lives, and you can barely even give a family closure. You know, and um. Well, it's more, was it like more recovery at that point? Yeah, well, and then this is, I'm talking about this is like right, right. the first day, the yeah. first. Um, but, you know, we cr climbed up and down, in and out of those piles. Um, I, w I was with a buddy, one buddy whose brother was missing, and uh, we were looking for him, and we, w we were pretty good friends. We had done some work together at the training academy, and, and I remember looking for him, and somehow him and I got separated, and I'm like, crap, you know, it wasn't a place you wanted to be by yourself, but yeah, it just ended up that way, and um, I remember one point I'd like, I had, I had to go upside down into a spot, and, and then there was a little bit of a bigger area that I could stand back up, and then I noticed a door, it was a stairway door, and uh, I stood in front of that door, and, I, and my logic told me, if you open that door, this is coming down, you know, the door frame is holding this pile up. I also knew that there could be people on the other side of that door. So I, m I made my, <laughs> my agreement with God at that point, and I, s I said, please don't let me die down here. And I opened that door, and a wisp of dust fell. Nothing, just went, psh, literally. I mean, it was, I, you can't tell me that some divine intervention didn't happen at that moment. The unfortunate part, it was, it was just some more debris. It was a wall of, wall of crap behind it. There was not, nobody there, and... But there's no logic that that pile shouldn't have shifted, and you know. Yeah. But you know, thankfully, it's not. It didn't, and I, you know, I made it out, and don't know how I made it out. Don't know how I got in. Don't know how I got out. Couldn't tell you right now. But um, it made me want to work more. You know, it's like okay, we're we're good. We're gonna be good. This is all gonna be fine. And you know, basically, spent all the way till Sunday was th it happened on a Tuesday. And then Sunday was the first day that we got pulled off. It started to rain, and they pulled everybody off the pile. So it was the first time pretty much that we stopped, or most of us anyway. Um, but, you know, we had so much support. I talk about, I'm in a way, I'm glad it happened in New York City because New York City's, you know, people are resilient, you know. People have car accidents, leave their car and go go, go to work and worry about it later. You know, it's... Because it's what you got to do. Yeah. You know, and this happened in New York. It, could, it probably would have been just as similar, like we talked about, maybe in Chicago or L.A. or, But 
we did what we did, and then, and everything we needed was there. All kinds of help. People people came from all over the country to help us, you know, and um, the the people on scene, the the secretaries, the the people that didn't want to leave, you know, um, nurses and doctors, and um, it was incredible, and it was it made us want to do more, want to keep pushing. Um, there was, you know, all of a sudden a, a bucket full of burgers would come up to the pile and you'd grab one, you know, all right, cool. Another bucket of waters would come up and as you're just digging. Because once you found a spot to dig, like a, if a dog hit on a spot, you didn't want to move because it all looked the same. If you would have spun in a circle, you wouldn't find that spot again, hmm. you know. That's, yeah. So you just, you keyed on the spot and you dug and dug and dug and, um, it just, it was, you know, I, I, I have trouble explaining it sometimes, but it really was, we were, we were motivated by the support we got, you know, it was incredible. And, um, unfortunately I, like I said, I lost 13 friends and, uh, you know, just from all the digging, I guess uh, that dust and whatnot on November 12th. I uh, I had gone to the medical office and they told me you're never gonna be a fireman again. I'm like, what? You're crazy. It's not. It's been nine years. It's been, you know, your lungs are bad. And so I was like, I wouldn't accept it. And um, so I ended up fighting it for 18 months of the the retirement. And then November, uh, March of '03, they finally retired me. They gave me a medical retirement. And um, I. That was it. I was. I mean, November November twelfth was the last day I was a, a full duty fireman. What were they saying was was wrong with your lungs? Just uh, we they call it reactive airway disease. Mm -hmm. So you have to have eighty percent of your lung capacity to be a full duty firefighter. And right after nine eleven, I had forty percent. And then in the in the months that followed, it recovered to about sixty percent, and then never got any better. So. With no, with medications and steroids and whatnot, it it still you know it basically allowed me to breathe at that point, but it didn't get well enough to uh, be a fireman. You know, yeah, it's almost like someone with asthma that's yeah. like having an as like yeah. a mild asthma attack constantly, and and any kind of dust or or smoke or exasperates it even more. You know, your 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 esophagus and all that it gets inflamed right away, and um. I, I was fortunate I went through a program um, that helped eliminate some of the toxins we inhaled. That was the, how, what it was designed to do. And I was able to get off of the steroids. But, um, you know, for the most part, I'm good. But I'm not running up, you know, 20 flights of stairs and putting yeah. out a fire anymore or, or breaking down a door. You know, it was, it's, it was a strenuous job, and I get it, but I still don't want to get it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's a that's a tough one to yeah. deal with as well. I tell myself now, I, I I think I can get myself in shape and get on another department somewhere. Just don't even tell them, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but you know, uh, the years the years have taken care of that. Yeah. Bit, well, so. again, you know, going back to that's the way we're built, right? Yeah. You're like, no, this is I want to do this job no matter what, and your brain is probably telling you like, yeah, we can keep going, but your body is like, no, this ain't happening. Yeah. Once I get out of bed and take a shower, I feel fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, Dude, when you were pulling, when y'all were pulling Brooklyn Bridge and pulling up to it, and you said, did you see that big? Because, I mean, I'm thinking, I, I'm trying to picture it. It's hard to picture it for someone that wasn't there, mm -hmm. right? And, I'm, and I've am and i I've just watched a lot of videos right. around it. And, I mean, there's all those videos of you see this. I mean, it's like a wall of, I mean, it looks like a Michael Bay film or something right. like that. Yeah, you know, no, it's like exactly. This wall of smoke just coming at you, and people are running. It was, and it it literally took your breath away. I mean, I at one point when that second tower came down and that that debris just came back up again, you know, and and it was the it was not just smoke and dust. It was debris. It was um, my experience with it was. I tell people if you want to really know what it felt like to try to breathe in that, go up in your attic to that blown in insulation and stick your head in it and take a deep breath. Mm. You know, it was, it was air full of chunks and, yeah. you know, terribleness that, you know, 
but we didn't have we didn't have the ability to have all those masks and stuff right off the bat. People said, "Well, why didn't you wear your your mask?" Well, first of all, those masks that we wear are per position on a rig. Well, so when you have a spare rig, they're not on there because they're expensive. So we went in without them, and then by the time you know they really f- figured out that we need to get some masks, you know, they gave us those dust masks, those painters masks, which you know, in five minutes were full and you'd have to rip them off and put it, couldn't breathe through it anymore. And you try to put another one on and then it got sweaty and it got, you know, so we just, yeah. we just didn't, you know, we, we didn't have what we, I want to, I don't want to say we didn't have what we needed. They did. No one would have imagined, you know, excuse me, that we could have needed that much stuff, you know, to prevent what happened to a lot of us, you know? Yeah. And then even like you said, the guys that did have masks, it's like impeding you from well, and, and, uh, doing your job what 100%. People don't, yeah, what people don't realize is those masks, they only give you, a, you know, about 12 minutes of operating time. It's a tank of air. It's, it's just compressed air, you know, atmospheric air that's, uh, you put it on your back, and it's, if you had a 30-minute cylinder, you had maybe 12 to 17 minutes of work time on it. If you had a 45-minute cylinder, you had maybe 26 minutes of work time. But that was it. Once that bottle's empty... That's yeah. just a, a weight on your back, you know. So That's it's crazy. Yeah, there was no and the guys that went in and that were in the building, you know, right away, um, they all had them, but that unfortunately wasn't wasn't their biggest problem. Yeah. It had to have been absolute chaos. I mean I mean, you have the even even the guys that uh heads of departments or chiefs like even the ones that were still there, like how, how, I mean, how do you manage something right. like that? I and mean, we had no radio communications. We had no cell communication. We had to operate as packs, and then that was initially, you know. Then later on, they were able to, to corral everybody up, and but you know, we 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 worked together with the the twenty or thirty guys that were around us. Hey, we're gonna go over here. Two, you go here. Two, you go here, and you know, you just start trying to do something where do you start yeah. you know um and then a couple of days later they came out with a list the department of guys that hadn't reported back into their firehouse well, there was almost 2000 people on that list so one of the biggest problems i had right after was my buddy kevin who we got we kind of got to the same firehouse at the same time we were probies together and then he got promoted and went to uh went to an engine in manhattan he he was missing and for the longest time we couldn't we didn't find his body and i would have these dreams and and it was because that list you'd be walking through search and come out somewhere or stop it somewhere where they had some food and run into somebody that was on the list and you know you'd grab him hey shithead you're on the list you know (laughs) give him a hug and call your fucking firehouse you know you're on the list and uh you know you give a hug and you move on well that's the problem i had i because we couldn't find Kevin, I kept dreaming that I came around the corner, and that was Kevin, you know. <clears throat> but unfortunately, that never happened, and uh, it wasn't until December we found Kevin. But uh, you know, it's like I said, the some part of some some of the hardest parts is you lost brothers, you lost guys that you were vacationing with, and you know, celebrating holidays with, and um, you know. It had never happened before. You know, we we never experienced it. We we lost a guy on Father's Day, the previous Father's Day, in a in a building collapse on the sidewalk. He was out on the sidewalk, and the facade came down and killed him. And I mean, we had such a hard time because he was a big part of. He had been in our firehouse, then he went to rescue, and um, and he was a big part of our. Um, he was like dad. You know, he was he was the senior guy that you know used to. If you had any questions, hey, I, I, I want to do this. I saw, can you cut this way or whatever? And he would help us out. And uh, and I thought that was going to be the hardest thing I was ever going to experience. But, it, you know, unfortunately it wasn't. You know, you know, with Danny being killed and, and you know, all these guys that got promoted out of our firehouse that were, were at every Christmas party and every picnic and every, you know, who's that? My kids knew their kids and they – you know, they were like this, you know, cousins, if you will, and and then all of a sudden they were gone, and it just yeah, it, it's your family. 
yeah, yeah. It's, it's tough to relate. And, and then, then came the funerals. It was, uh, you know, November 12th was, I was now on medical leave. So I was not, I didn't have to report into the firehouse. I was doing nothing. I was, now I was divorced, sitting at home, you know, crying to myself, trying to keep from my family from knowing what I was going through and going to funerals every day, sometimes two a day, sometimes a couple times three a day. And um, I got to a point, um, I lost count, but I, I, I can ballpark, it was over 150 funerals I had been to, and I just woke up one morning and said, I can't, I can't. Yeah, that, I mean. I couldn't look at one more little kid holding his dad's mm-hmm. helmet. You know, it was it was brutal. Yeah, the emotional toll it takes on a person. I mean, it's the same premise. I mean, when we, we obviously we lost tons of people during the past twenty years of war because of nine eleven, mm-hmm. and but you know the the biggest one was obviously extortion seventeen. We lost you know all those seals and but even you know before and after that, you're constantly going to funerals and it does it takes a toll on you emotionally and you feel selfish. And I, I went to the same thing where you're like, I don't want to go to another funeral. I don't want to watch another buddy getting buried and then having to look at his kids or his wife. But you force, you know, you, you force yourself to go. But at the same time, it's it really doesn't it doesn't do you any good. You know, it's no. almost a detriment. Right. Um, oh, without a doubt. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm glad now today that I went to what I went to. The hard part for me was like there was so many. What made so you know, you know, a funeral, uh, a line of duty death, a you know, military death, the thousands of people go. You wear it's a big deal, and the first few funerals were like that. They were four or five, six thousand people at you know, and uh, a normal funeral in under normal times would be ten thousand people. Right after nine eleven, the first couple of funerals, five, six, eight. As it got down, you know, all of a sudden there was a couple hundred funerals. Then we were encouraging people from other departments from other states to come and be at a funeral, you know, because they deserve the same funeral that the, the first guy that was buried yeah. did. And that's why when you make that decision to not go to this one, it's like, shit, why this, why, how can I not go, you know? How can I be another person that abandoned this guy that was, you know, he deserves that. Yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's tough. Yeah. It's a... Uh, yeah, it's like it's a conundrum, you know, because you're like, well, is this going to be beneficial to me mentally if I keep going to these things? But then, yeah, you then you feel that shame of no, I'm being I'm being a pussy right now, mm-hmm. and I should show up. I, right. I should show up for these guys, but at the same time, knowing like I'm going to go through another spiral of you know another funeral, and obviously, I'm sure just like in the teams, I'm sure that then there's a tons of alcohol involved. Everyone's you know trying to drink away the pain, um, and that just adds more. I, I was fortunate that I had, they had a, after, when this, once they put us on medical leave, they assigned us counselors, mm-hmm. and my counselor was a young guy that, um, you know, I don't know if he's ever even seen a car accident happen, you know, and, <laughs> and uh, but his, his, every first question was, how was you drinking this weekend? I said, I drank, I don't know, a couple of cases of beer, a couple, of, all right, okay, how, you got a headache? Yeah, yeah. I mean, but it felt good. All right, when are you going to drink again? I don't know. He's like, you sure? I said, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe today, maybe next week. He's like, okay, you're fine. I'm like, oh, okay. He said, if if you don't wake up in the morning looking for your next drink, you're okay. You're allowed because of the magnitude, I guess. I'm assuming, unless he didn't know what he's talking about. But for me, it worked. Yeah. You're allowed to forget today. But you can't use the alcohol as a crutch. Yeah. The alcohol is to help just reset you. And I, that's kind of, I made it a point after he started telling me that, that if I would want to go out drinking that night, I'd say, no, see, that's maybe, then I have a problem. If I go drinking tonight, they, you know, I'm letting the alcohol win. And I'm not saying I never got drunk because of it again, but I got drunk on my terms when I really felt like I just needed it today to, to start over again. And, um, and he, he really, he saw my 
I've tried to force myself to have a lot of positivity mm-hmm. afterwards because I believe I'm blessed that I'm here, and I believe the fact that I'm I didn't die that day is because God's got a plan, and now I have to make myself worthy of that plan. So, you know, my counselor's like, "How do you get out of bed in the morning one day?" And I'm like, "What do you mean?" He says, "All right, I'm gonna expl- I'm gonna tell you your life, and then." Tell me what you think. I go, okay. He goes, you got divorced two weeks before 9-11. On 9-11, you lost 13 close friends. On November 12th, they took the job away from you that you loved. Yet you come in here every Monday morning smiling, thinking how good, how fortunate you are about being here. How do you do that? I'm like, well, you're the counselor. You're not supposed to be telling me that. <laughs> you He's, tell me. He says, because I'm talking to guys that came two or three days later didn't get divorced, didn't lose anybody directly, helped out and are, are having trouble with what they saw. Not that there's anything less about that, but when I tell them it's normal, they look at me like, well, who are you? You know, you didn't, you've never done this. What, what are you telling me? He says, but you can tell them that, that those bad days they're having is normal. You should be feeling that way. Yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, I ended up helping out and doing some grief counseling with him, and um, it helped me. You know, I started to realize, oh, maybe this is part of my plan. Maybe this, you know, helping, you know, I just helped one human being, you know, that may, you know, may change his life by telling him my story, which is why I'm here now, you know, because I like to tell people that whatever you're going through, there's people that go through a lot worse Mm -hmm. and not that mine's more important than yours or whatever, but there is a, there is tomorrow, but it's how you handle it. It's not. It's not going to be handed to you. It's not doesn't just get better. You have to want it to get better. Yeah, you have to work for it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here. But do you? you know. I mean, do you think that you had such a different outlook, or you know, like you said, you were like, I'm going to have a positive attitude. I mean, do you think your faith had anything to do with that? Like, I think you, so. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I like I told you guys the other day, I'm not a. I'm not a big Bible guy. I'm not a, but I mean, I grew up a, you know, Roman Catholic. I was an altar boy. <laughs> Same. You know, yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I can't tell you. I went through a lifetime of, of masses just till I, by the time I was 12 years old, you know, but I don't necessarily agree that a building makes the difference on what your beliefs. Yeah. I, I believe from what I was taught that whoever your, your maker is and your beliefs is, if they are who they say they are, or then they understand. If you just lay in bed, or if you're sitting in the car, and I like to turn the radio down and and talk like he's like he's there. The, the person who I bl- have given my control of my life over, I talk to like he's a friend. Mm-hmm. And I, if people really know what I've been through in my life and and where I am in my life, I'm very fortunate and I'm very blessed. And you know, I'd like to believe, I'd like to know that people would say, hmm, maybe he's on to something there, you know? Yeah. So. I mean, that's, yeah, that's another way of leading by example. Right. Um, you know, because they're, I'm sure you had buddies that weren't doing so hot that, like you just said, that really didn't have the same amount of trauma that you did leading up to 9-11 and then afterwards. And they're probably looking at you like, how is this guy? still going in such a positive right. attitude, but then they watch you or you tell them like your own personal relationship with Christ. And you're like, I talk to him on a daily basis. Um, that right there is like, okay, there's something there. Um, and hopefully that, you know, bled off unto them. Right. And I, I try not to, I try not to make my conversations only when I'm having a shitty day. Yeah. I try, you know, and, and I'm not going to say that I, Talk to talk to him every day. I just it just comes up sometimes, and I sometimes I'll be driving by the beach and say, "Hey, thanks," you know, I appreciate it. And uh, you know, I, like I said, I'm blessed. I have a whole new family. Uh, my kids are good. I mean, would I've done some some stuff different as far as my kids go and whatnot? Yeah, probably. But it's hard to explain to somebody why why when you do something for your for your inside. It's hard to tell somebody that that's why you did. Yeah, you know, I mean, I moved away from my kids. I regret to this day that I did. Thank God that they turned out good and they're in, they're a good place. And but I know they they miss having their dad full time. Yeah, and it sucks. 
I can't go back though, but I can tell them that I, I don't know where I would have been if I didn't leave New York and start over. Yeah. You know, it was tough. It was tough to, you know, and then my, my oldest son ended up moving out to California and graduating high school there. Um, my youngest son, every time there was a, uh, break school break you know I flew him out and we had you know we were we were pretty close it still it wasn't wasn't like I had never talked to them again we still you know we talk all the time and we I'm up on my on their lives and whatnot at one point I had a uh, a parent I was at m one of my son's games in New York and they're like don't you live in California I'm like yeah they're like you're at more games than I am I says well you know that's because I have to it's it's a it's a selfish way, if you will, to make up for being not being there every day. But I know there's there's parents that live in the houses with their kids that don't put the time in that I put in. Yeah, you know, as little as that was, and I'm sure my kids will will tell you, you know, it sucked that I didn't have my dad every day. But they had me. They had me to, on the phone, or they had me, you know, when they came out to visit or whatever. But you know, I I see it now. I have I have some friends that I know that they. You know, they work all the time, and when they're home, they're not there for the kids. They're just, you Well, know. they take it for granted. Yeah. And that's that's the beauty of going through something like you did, that trauma. You know, like, what you have is special, and it's not you didn't abandon your kids. You right. took off for your own mental health. Well, and that, that's the thing. I don't know what I what type of person I would have become. Like, we talked about the alcohol and whatever. Yeah. If I'd have stayed in New York and those constant reminders and those constant might have might have made me get worse. Might have made, I did not like the person I was becoming when I decided to move to California. Um, it was, um, I mean, maybe things would have been still good. I don't know. But at that moment, I had to make a decision. Do I want to be a, a shitty present dad or do I want to be a, an okay, not present dad, you know? Yeah. And I decided I wanted to be, I wanted to be an example. If, you know, even if I wasn't the everyday dad, I wanted to, them to say, that's my dad and that's what they can, you know, they can shoot for. And, and knock on wood, my, my boys have done well for themselves. My, my oldest son wanted to be a fireman, but he had a little football injury that his, he's like, nah, eh, my back's not going to take that. So he's a flight medic now in up, upstate New nice. York. And, you know, he's to me, he's my hero. He's it's cool what he does. You know, yeah, he's saving lives every day. But if you wouldn't have taken care of yourself, you might not have been there. Period. Right. Right. I mean, I, oh, I'm, I'm sure those those couple months after, right? Like that had that has to be like some of the darkest. Like, I mean, you possibly. I don't see how you could have done that with not being somewhat suicidal at some level of having or, or just yeah, absolutely. I, I in don't a know dark that place. I ever actually thought in those terms, yeah. you know, but that didn't mean I wasn't reckless to the point that I didn't give a shit what happened, sure. which might as well have been suicidal. You know, I mean, I, I drank sometimes too that I couldn't see and I drive home. Sure. That's suicidal. You yeah. know, even though I wasn't thinking of killing myself, yeah. I was doing stuff that I could kill myself. You suicidal know? tendencies. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and lo like as luckily for me, I never, I didn't really, I didn't do that a lot. I didn't, I mean, I don't know. Maybe I did. Maybe there's times I don't even remember I did. But I knew if I stayed in New York, if I had those constant reminders, then I, you know, I had to relive it in a sense, you know. Did, did you, during that time, did you, I mean, have just absolute rage towards the terrorists that did this? And then also, did you really struggle um, with God, how, how how could you have let this happen? How, my friends. Well, that's that's always the first question. You know, how do I believe that you have control, and then this happens. You know, I don't. I've I I don't know. I've always believed that things happen in life. They're for a reason. Good, bad, or indifferent. We don't know. We may not know until we're gone, or you know, who knows? We may never know. But. Because I believe that there is a bigger, bigger purpose, a bigger, higher power. There's, there's more to us he living here than than we know. Yes, it's very easy to say, God, how could you do this to me? And, but it's also easy to say, you know what? He didn't do this to me. This had to happen. Mm -hmm. This changed thing. Who knows where we would have been in the world? Like, 
if we didn't get a, a wake up call, if you will, to say, you know, maybe these people are not our friends, you know, and I, I don't know, you know, I don't know why this stuff happens. Why do the earthquakes happen? Why did the, why did the you know, hurricanes come through? Why people get killed every day with no explanation on on how that happens? Um, if you get mad at everything, you you might as well give up. I mean, yeah, you gotta you know you gotta say oh, shit. That's part of life, you know. And God takes takes little babies away. God takes old people away. God takes people our age away. You think I don't think that's his plan is to in in instill suffering on us. No. It's to learn some lessons and bring us closer and maybe test us for what co- what's to come, you know? Yeah. I, I that's what I truly believe. I mean, I think and but I think in order to believe that you have to have complete hundred percent complete faith in him. Yeah. And give complete control over to him and be like mm-hmm. Even in those dark times, because that's and that is him testing you in a way, or you are being tested because it is very easy in times like that, or just you know when, especially dealing with death, to get angry at God or to like, you know, how could you do this? And if you keep that, and I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen with my friends, you know, or even in myself sometimes. And that you go down that road, that's that anger is nothing but poison. And that is just going to consume you if you just stay there in that anger. But if you allow yourself to give complete control over to God, which is a very hard thing to do, I'm not saying it's easy, but if you get to that point and you are able to do it, you, the amount of weight that is lifted off of you, and it's like, okay, he has a purpose. He, you know, this happened for a reason, and then you can go on living for, you know, especially like what you're doing now. You're living for those that didn't make it. Right. You're telling their story, You're, t- you know, which I think is, you know, beyond amazing, especially now, you know, we're 21 years after, mm-hmm. and you're making sure that that day is not forgotten right? and that those people are remembered. That is the purpose. Exactly. You know? I mean, we're, we're on the verge of, of potentially more bad shit happening right now. This, the world is screwed up, mm-hmm. but you can't wake up in the morning with fear of that. You have to wake up and say, how can I change this? Even if it means just changing it, you had an argument with your next door neighbor, you know. Yep. You know, it's not. You're not. You may not be able to change the world, but you might be able to change your neighbor's opinion of you, or you know, or your opinion of your neighbor. You know, they if they don't know, if you're not positive about things, how are you going to fix it? How are you going to exactly? You know, it's uh, you know, my wife's a perfect example. We met through grief. When I met her, she was married. I met her at a campground with a bunch of firemen. She was with one group of firemen. I was with another group of firemen in California. And uh, how we met was they introduced us, and they had told me that they had lost a nine-month-old, a 19-month-old baby um, and drowned in the hot tub. And I <coughs> was like, God, I don't know how I would ever, ever survive that, you know. So immediately when I met her, I put her on a pedestal because she was amazing. She was you know, if we talked about the story, we talked about my story, we talked about how you get over grief. Again, no, I was in a relationship, she was married. There was no background to it. It was just grief. It was this complete discussion of grief. Had we never crossed paths again, we changed each other's outlook, if you will, you know, because she was not angry at what happened. She was. She had a little trouble with God over it. She probably had a lot of trouble, God over. It. But she was not angry at the circumstance that I. When she told me, I was angry. And then I'm thinking, how could she? This, this woman's. This woman's strong. That she's not letting anger change her. And and like God's plan, we. I didn't see her again for a little over a year. And when we ran into each other, we talked about that conversation. And then. She was single, and I was single, and here we are. You know, <laughs> next week's our, our well, a couple of weeks is our th- uh, thir- 14th anniversary. It's like, you know, God's got a plan. Yep. You know, I helped her. She's helped me. And it's uh, grief. Grief has to happen. Grief, you know, it always, it, uh, you know, we go through it all the time. 
our parents die, our grandparents die, our neighbors die, our friends die. You know, you know it's how you handle it. Yeah, that's the important part. Yeah, you're allowed to grieve. Absolutely, like you, you should. You should have to, but you don't sit in that grief forever. Mm -hmm. And that's been my big thing with my wife. When when we started dating and she would have a bad day, I'd tell her right there, I said, listen, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. It's Wednesday. That's your day. Tomorrow morning, bullshit. You're not grieving anymore. You can grieve for a day. We're going to move on because that's not what we're supposed to do. Yeah. And, And she remembers that. She you know, she appreci- and, sh- and then she would stop grieving even sooner because she knew that I wasn't making it, oh, you're being stupid, uh, you know. No, that's the wrong way to handle it. The right way to handle it is, yes, having a bad day, go cry, you know. Yeah. Um, Which I think is also tough. I mean, going back for guys like us or in our community, like you're, at least for in the community that I came from, if something bad happened, it was like, you know, you shove it down. Mm-hmm. And you don't show any emotion about it, which is, I think, the most detrimental thing you can do. Right. Like not allowing yourself to grieve, right? Mm-hmm. Which, I mean, I'm guilty of it big time, where it's like, nope. Yeah, because we're big, t- tough guys, yeah, you right? know. And You're like, I'm this not supposed isn't going to gonna cry, bother me. And I'm, you know. Exactly. And then, you know, obviously, I'm sure you've seen it. You push enough stuff down, it's all going to come bubbling oh, out yeah. at some point. And yeah. it's not going to come out in the way that you want no. it. And you, Absolutely. And in a way that you can control. Yeah. So no, I right. definitely think grieving is such an important process. But and then again, there's that line. It's like grieve, then move on. Like and you're allowed to grieve, yeah. but you just got to there's limitations, which is why, which is one of the reasons why I left New York because everybody in New York was going through it. There was no one to cry to. Yeah, there was. You know, who am I? You know, every this this guy was with me. I you know I cry. He he he's had it as bad as me. There was nobody. I, you know, I didn't even, my mother didn't know where I was or what I did on 9-11 until the 10th anniversary when I spoke at a, uh, I spoke at an event that she came to in California. She's like, I didn't even realize. I said, yeah, Ma, because you didn't need to know. Yeah. You know, <laughs> she didn't need to know the details. She, she just needed to know that I was safe. That's it. You know, um, so that's, like I said, that's getting out of New York changed my life and I mean I, I kind of touched on the circumstances of going to California that that's what saved my life yeah you know uh, that that company that guy in California that flew 1100 of us out to say thank you and again we landed in California we were treated like rock stars and we were treated like stars, rock stars when we left uh, Newark you know fighter jet escort across the country that's and, awesome you know it was incredible and the pilot was like I I've never experienced it, but I, you know, other than presidents, nobody gets this kind of treatment, and they treated us like they couldn't give enough for us. And and I told the uh, David McDonald was his name, and he owned a company called Pelco, and he did this 100% his money in in you know his own way, and he wanted to do it as big as he could for us. And I've told him I became friends with him, and and I told him that you know you saved my life, David. And he's like, what, is, what do you mean? I said, you saved my life. I was going off in a direction that I wasn't proud of. And this trip made me realize that maybe it isn't so bad. You know, maybe life isn't what I think it is. You know, and it you know, made me want to change directions. And that's why I ended up in California. So it was, uh, you know, again, God's plan. Another divine intervention. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it happens all the time. How was uh how was it the transition from New York to California? It was it was interesting for a little while. So I had gone I had been going back and forth. I had met a girl on that first trip, so she was an excuse to go back and forth. And um, and then I got became friends with a bunch of the firemen out there, and uh, they used to they invited me every year on nine eleven to he was he, the same guy did the same ceremony for us again each year. He set up a memorial out there and. Um, and uh, so that we then we played in a, a make a wish base a softball tournament, Fresno Fire Department versus Fresno Police Department, and uh, again you know they, I got announced I was the first one at bat and you know for me you know I never I was never in a professional stadium like that you know and 
And it was like, oh, now batting right in front of the New York City Fire Department, <laughs> number nine, Andy. Yes. And the place went berserk. There was like 10,000 people at this oh, charity awesome. game for Make-A-Wish. And, uh, you know, my adrenaline kicked in, and I and I hit a ball to the to deep right center, to the wall, and I ended up getting a triple, and I'm not a fast guy. <laughs> <laughs> but those are the things that just push because, again, not not so much the, the hit or the playing the game or – it was the people that were there to meet me, to hear my story, to want to know. And, again, I, I just kept in my head, all these people, someone's taking something good away from yep. here, you know, which is what motivated me to keep doing that. And, you know, I went ended up speaking all over the country at schools and whatnot. And once I started to talk, you, you know, you'd be in a gymnasium with 600 kids. You could hear a pin drop, you know, and, and – and then they want to ask questions. And then I get letters from the teacher that they can't stop talking about, you know, having met this fireman from 9-11. And, you know, I don't know if any of them changed their lives or, but at least it, they had something to think about, you know, to remember. Maybe I'm not going to, you know, be so mad today or, you know. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. incredible. Yeah. I mean, especially with kids, you know, that's, I think that's the most important is getting them to, you know, hear your story when all your brother stories and that, because I don't, I think that's, well, I think it's definitely lost now. You know, I think the further I'm, we get I'm away trying, from it. I'm trying not to, I can't, you know, I can't, I, anytime someone asks me, I want to talk about yeah. it. When we moved here now, now my wife works at, the, at a school and, and they want me to come and talk on nine eleven, and And it's like a good, and we need that. Cause these are elementary school kids. They're not even, they're nine eleven is not even on the radar for them. You know, yeah, it's a piece of history. Yeah. And yeah. that, if it's in, if it's allowed to be put in the history books anymore. Uh, yeah, I can tell you from personal experience, like here, I went and talked. I, luckily, I had a teacher come and ask me to come talk last year at my, uh, my daughter's school. And she said, she's like, in history, we don't even, we don't talk about 9-11. We don't talk about the global war on terror. It's not in there. And she's like, would you come in and give a talk yeah. about it? And I was like, how can they not? talk about it that's a massive piece of history right mm. yeah yeah no they don't you know because of the circumstance the evil behind it i guess the, but the there was the same evil in at you know in uh, hawaii in on december 7th yeah you know say you know they attacked our soil because of hatred for us for you know wait what did we do you know i mean i don't understand how how you attack a whole race a whole belief system and but yeah, you know, I'm just not wired that way, but uh, I, I don't think a lot of us are. Yeah, <laughs> thank goodness. <laughs> yeah, but uh, um, I mean, when we fir when we first met, the first thing that Drake actually introduced us, he said, "Hey, he he's he's worried about people forgetting kids mm -hmm. this next generation forgetting about 9/11." I mean, today you've gone out of your way to come here. You don't get paid like it's no, all. It's, it's, it's because it's people need to remember, and and even if it's so simple as getting cut off tomorrow, you know, just give a wave. Even if they give you the finger, give a wave. Have a nice day and drive away, because life's not that shit is not important. You know, if someone if someone threatens your family, even even if it's verbally, you got to do. You know, you got to defend your the people you love. But if it's because someone doesn't like how you drive. Well, yeah. Guess what? Yeah. Have a good day. Yep. You know, so there's that part of it, and then there's the don't forget because whatever happened that day, how it, how what made what those people that attacked us believed were taught to to know us as we all know wasn't true. We, uh, you know, Americans as a culture are not evil people. Are not out to get anybody. We just, uh, there's cultures that teach that, you know, and if we can kind of, you know, if someone sees this, if someone from another country sees us talking and, and you know, uh, you know, maybe, hey, even if it's one person, yeah, why, why is everybody so mad at them? But, you know, I, I just, I want, I want these kids growing up to say, all right, we got to do something to prevent stuff like this from happening because what a shitty world we would live in if this went on all the time yeah and i also think kids need to know the truth and you know i think they they want to shelter these kids 
in this society. And it's like, no, there are people out there in the world that hate you. Right. That hate you just for being you. Mm -hmm. That hate you just for being an American. Yeah. It's it's the truth. Yeah. I oh, mean, I know it. But that wants to be silenced. They're like, no, we don't want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to talk about that because we don't want to hurt the people that hate us feelings. And then they might come back again. Yeah. And you're like, dude, that's, we first off, we're America. And we don't, we're not scared of anything. Right. And we should be able to tell the truth. But I think, obviously, not only that, but the truth nowadays is hidden from everybody. Mm -hmm. Because nobody wants to get their feelings hurt. Nobody wants to, you know, actually talk about the hard things. Right. It's we, uh, it's a shame. We we have a we're in the middle of a smoke screen right now going on in our world where they're they're taking things that don't really need to be talked about. They can happen whether you approve of them or don't approve of them. They're not going to affect your life or my life, or, but they're putting it up front and they're trying to make that. Hey, look over here. Look, you know whatever you believe about the gender things and whatever. We're not going to talk about that, but there's no reason why we all have to be looking over here so that we don't look over here. Yep. You know, it's, it's silly. It's, it's, we're, we're creating a, you know, like I said, smoke and mirrors is, is what they're, they're trying to do. And in the, in the meantime, we have a, we have, I went to, I was just in Mexico. Amazing people. We had a, the best time, but there are people that go to Mexico and act like assholes, which gives them a reason to believe that what they're told is true, you yeah. know? And it's like, well, don't be an asshole, period. Just, you know, if people just be decent people. Yeah, I think there's definitely that. I mean, they're going to have assholes in every every group, right. in every race. Right. You know, it's there's, there's no getting around that. But that we have to stop blanket statement, everything, right? right. So it's, you know, it's just like the whole defund the police thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's bad cops. Right. There's also a ton of good cops. There's bad firefighters. There's bad people in the military. There's bad people that work at Walmart. You think if you, you have a bad interaction at Walmart with somebody, then is it, well, screw Walmart right. everybody all together? No. No. It's But that's the route we've gone in this country where somebody makes a mistake, and now it's like that whole group is persona non grata, mm -hmm. and we have to definitely get away from that. Yeah. No, that's 100% true. It's just how do we, how do we again, anybody that puts a uniform on, whether – What's in the uniform is what you respect or not. The, you need to respect the uniform. Yeah. And they don't anymore. Nobody does. It's terrible. And the fact that the fact that a cop can, has to worry about getting shot because some other cop pulls someone over and, you know, I used to tell firemen, they'd come in the firehouse in the morning, fucking cop gave me a ticket. For, my first question was, is that what you said to him when he pulled you over? <laughs> Because I guarantee you said, oh, man, hey, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm late. I uh, really apologize. I said, I, you know, if I'm on the job. He probably, he may not have given you a ticket, but if you said, fucking cop, I'm in a rush. I got to go. Come on, let's get this. I'm a fireman. Leave me alone. You got a ticket. Yeah. You know, that's it's it's in the attitude. And, you know, I don't know. We have, I'm hoping some, some young kids. I, eat. I'm being positive about it. And I, yeah. I, I am definitely optimistic that times it will it will turn mm -hmm. i i have a feeling like i feel like it's turning a little bit already i, I believe so too and i think we're on that that momentum mm -hmm. of like okay we're gonna get back to somewhat of normalcy yeah you know i'm hoping that it's just gonna the be good people start being contagious you know but you have to you have to put some effort in yeah to share the good if you will you know and you also have to be patient yes that's yep. the other thing i think that's the other problem is everybody wants it done now. It's like we want to change now. It's like, no, nope, change takes time. You right. have to be patient with it. And I definitely I see the pendulum starting to move back. Um, but, you know, it also takes, like you said, people like you and everybody else to well, sort of stand up. What you guys up. are doing and, you know. Yeah. Well, everyone does their little part, right? Like right. The, it, I think is because I'm I've never worn a uniform. I'm a private have been private citizen entirely but but it doesn't mean that i don't have some sort of not maybe a duty mm -hmm. or something to do duty, whatever yeah. within my gifts right, right to 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 help i think a lot of private people need to do more for military and servicemen um wh with whatever sphere that they can mm -hmm. um but i i 
I think on like that when I think about that day, I think it was like two thousand over two thousand people, innocent Americans. Yeah. Right. That either died because they were in the towers or rushed in like you did, mm-hmm. right, to help. But out of like probably one of the darkest times came this like un- uniting of them. I mean, I've I've I felt it in Dallas, Texas, mm-hmm. right? I remember that day. That whole day was just like it was almost it, someone complete. I'd never been to New York City at that point. But it was like it it, it personally felt like an it, attack towards on you, me, right? right? Like my country. Mm-hmm. And there was this, uh, I, I think that's that's a time that I felt America so united. I, 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 I told you I spoke every year at that uh, in California at the – California 9-11 Memorial, and and at, at some point I decided it was time to not necessarily talk about what happened on 9-11, but talk about 9-12. Yeah. Because I wish we could go back to 9-12, because on 9-12 we were all Americans. It didn't matter what color we were, where we were, what our financial status was, we were Americans. And we need to get back to that. We, we are an amazing country. Uh, people can do whatever they want. You're free to earn. You're free to not earn. You're free to live. You're free to do whatever you want. What What's to be upset about, you know? Are, are some people more fortunate than others? Yes. But a lot of people make their own fortune, you know, so. Which is what makes this country what it is. Right. Is you can come here right. and make your own fortune. You just have to work for it. Exactly. You know, and I get, yeah. And like, like you said, there are people that, people start off at different levels. Mm-hmm. And life is unfair. And I but that's also the beauty of America is we help those people who start off on different levels, right? right? I mean, we have a system set in place. Mm-hmm. I just think that people are taking advantage of that. Right. And everybody is like, well, I'm starting off a victim right away. And it's like, no, you're definitely not. No. You're in a position it's where a you can you can work and make something. You're just being lazy. Yeah. It's almost an epidemic in mediocrity. You, you want to – if you – you woke up this morning thinking, all right, I'm going to make enough to eat dinner tonight. If you're okay with that, you can't complain, you know. Then these, those same people are getting upset that I might have picked up a new car today, you know. Well, it, it's because I didn't get up and make enough money for dinner today. That's I made enough money to pick up this new car today, you know. Yeah, I worked. I earned, right. I earned it. And I'll help you. Come talk to me, yeah. and I'll show you exactly what I did, and you can do it too. You know, that's the beauty of living here, but people have sort of have forgotten that. But we need to we need also need to stop keeping trying to keep up with the Joneses. Yeah. You know, I tell I my to me my biggest what I believe is one of the biggest problems where that we're battling now is our, our kids, our our high teens to late twenties right now think that we should give them a lot or give them more or give them, Yeah. And that's because that's our fault. That's my generation's mm-hmm. fault because I wanted my kids to have more than I had. And now they want it. They still want it. And it's like, no, well, now it's time for you to do that for your kids. You know, but do we really need a TV you can see, see from space? You know, <laughs> do we need a new car every two years? You know, why don't, we, why don't we drive a 10-year-old car and let mom stay home when the kids get home from school? You know, because we don't have any car payments and she can stay home and and make a snack for them and ha- go play in the yard with them instead of all these kids that are getting on the internet and thinking that the world is all rosy outside of them. You know, well, they're seeing all these kids. That's oh, what social media does. Right. It's oh, a, it's look how nice it is. Oh, why am I why am I so deprived? And what are they doing? They're shooting up schools and they're shooting. They're trying to get attention in any way they can. You know, and yet. You know, the world is blaming it on the gun they took to school. The gun didn't do nothing. The yeah. gun the gun would have been just fine sitting where it was, mm-hmm. you know. But the kid that we didn't pay attention to for the last 12 years. It's a mental health problem. Yes. That's, I mean, it's not a gun problem. Yeah. It's a mental health problem. I, n- I nobody need to because I get political, and I'll get yeah. on that political we'll, train. And <laughs> we'll, we'll, we won't go down this rabbit hole. We'll save that for another time. Yes. Hey, it's called Shoot Me Straight. There's there no go. There's yeah. no agendas here. I, that's, I, I love it. I mean, I knew when I met you guys, it was just we were going to talk about facts. Yeah. Well, one, one thing, I, when I was counseling, I, was, I, I didn't talk much about mine, but I used to be a professional counselor when I was counseling families especially parents over and over and most of them were really affluent they would say 
I want it. I want my kids to have, you know, what I didn't have growing up or so forth or, you know, basically filling gaps that I felt like, you know, that I want my kids to have. And I would always, I'd go back and I get what they'd mean in some ways, but I'd go back and I'd go, okay, did you go to college? And they'd say, yes. And I'd say, well, did you, did you have to work while you're in college? Oh, yeah. Like, or I paid my way through college, or, mm-hmm. you know, and these are, you know, multimillionaire right. families and, and they're, they, they go through of like how they've struggled and how they've had to overcome struggles and all this stuff. And then I'm like, would you take that back? And they'd say, oh, no way. It's made me who I am today. And then I said, well, mm-hmm. then why are you taking that away from your from kids? From your kids, yep. Absolutely. You know? and, and and I know, like, yeah, you're not the – you didn't – not the absolute perfect father that did every single thing right. Like, no one is. Nobody it's is. Like, and, and it's – but when you talk about your kids, when we were at lunch, I was, you could just see how proud you are of them. Of yeah, how I'm very proud. I mean, we did our best. I tell my, my wife all the time, and if, one, if I see my ex-wife, because we're still friends, I, I'll say, listen, we raised four kids. None of them, they all graduated high school. Mm-hmm. No one went to jail. No one's on drugs. <laughs> no one got pregnant or got anybody pregnant. Dude. That's a success yeah. in today's world. That's where the sadness starts. Because why are we so proud that our kids didn't get get in trouble? We should be proud that our kids are, you know, like our parents wanted our kids wanted us to be doctors, lawyers, and Indian chiefs, you know? And yeah. um we're just happy that our kid graduated high school. <laughs> that's I mean, that's the how that's my thought process. I mean, I you know, obviously you want the best for your kids and you want them to be successful, but as a parent, in my mind, I'm like, as long as I can, you can instill your values and beliefs in them while they're in your house, mm-hmm. right? And that's that's all you can do is just like, hey, this is what we believe in, this family, this is our values. Th- they're going to do their own thing eventually. I mean, I have right. a 22-year-old, a 19-year-old now, and then obviously a 13-year-old, but, you know, the 22 and 19, they're they're leaving the nest, or they already have left the nest. And it, you just realize at some some point you're like, okay, I you have I let letting you go, and I you just hope that the values and beliefs that you instill to them stick with them. And even if they go away from that, that they'll be drawn back to them. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know I did that. You know, I I grew up just like you. Uh, you know, my dad's strict Catholic, altar boy, went to church every Sunday. You know, they my dad was like really big on you know the CCD and doing all that stuff and I completely went away from it when I left the house I was like done with that you know but 10 years later I'm I came back to it Mm -hmm. because I knew that's what was right Right. that was like my place of comfort is like yes I know this is what's good for me and I that's what I just hope with my kids and I'm sure with yours you're like even if they go off the whatever beaten path Mm -hmm. they'll come back yeah and uh, like I said for me fortunately um, I'm pretty you know I'm pretty lucky where my kids are uh, I just, again, talking, doing this kind of stuff, and hopefully some parent will realize it and will realize that as a society that we don't, why do we, why are we trying to prove to other people we're better? Let's let's worry about, you know, setting a good example for our kids, you know, mm-hmm. just make them, you know, give them a little time, you know, when they ask, can we play ball or can we, you know, yeah, go play ball. Take ten minutes. You know, I, it's the other day. I, I live in an, in a little neighborhood, and uh, the other day I came out of my uh, friend's house. I was helping him out in the garage, and there are all these kids running around playing on the street, big big wheels, little kids, all you know, from ten down. And I said, "Hey, don't you kids have any video games or something?" <laughs> <laughs> but I really meant it sarcastically because I was loving it. Yeah. You know, we always grown up spent time outside. You know. Uh, but I, like you said, is that the turn? Is that the coming around the corner that we're going to, you know, the values in the home going to change and then it's going to change all the way, you know, throughout, hopefully. Yeah. I have a lot of faith in, we were pretty much in this predicament, the end of the sixties, early seventies, very similar things going on in the world, a lot of divides, a lot of, and we came back around and, you know, so the key is not to lose faith. In humanity, if you will. Exactly. Yeah. And don't listen to the uh, mainstream media and what they're telling you. Yes. 
Yeah. Uh-huh. We're, we're I want Bugs Bunny back on EA. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, dude, thank you so much, Andy. Oh, thank you guys. It's uh, it's therapy for me. Like I said, I my goal is to do a little good, and I you know th- stuff like this I believe does. And oh, know. for sure. Yeah. I mean, dude, I can't tell you how amazing it is. I mean, I'm when we met the other day, I was like, you know, I went home and told my wife, I'm like, this guy is awesome, uh, and what you're doing, you know, keeping. 9-11 in everybody's minds, you know, and not in a negative way, in a positive way. Right. And you're setting that example for others. I mean, that's truly unbelievable. Like, you're still going and doing that. And yeah, uh, and I know you don't like hearing it, man, but, like, you are a hero. You're a hero in my eyes. I mean, you're – you guys, what you did on that day is the reason that me and my brothers kept going back overseas and – getting vengeance for what happened that day. Yeah. I mean, that's that's pretty much run my life, my whole adult life. And, you know, just to be able to sit down with you and talk to you about it has been awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah. It's been it's awesome to be with people that like minded people, if you will, and, and you know, guys that there's no no agenda here. We just yeah. we all we all want the same result out of this. Someone gets a someone sitting listening is maybe all right, tomorrow's going to change for me. Those yeah. guys are cool. Yeah, I'd li- definitely like to, uh, uh, in the future, like hopefully maybe this year, do a, a speaking thing with you at the, one of the schools. Yeah, I that'd think be awesome. that would be, you know, have you come in there and then yeah, talk definitely. about. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. And, we'll, we'll and if there's anybody that. out there that wants to talk to us direct, if things are going on in your life and you need some help, I'd be happy to if you guys hear of it or, you know, uh, get a hold of someone here and and because like i said it, it, that's my purpose in life so are you on social media 